Welcome to the New Church Podcast. So John Lennon said that life is what happens while you're busy making plans. But there's this old Yiddish proverb that puts it this way. Man plans and God laughs. The book of Proverbs says it like this. Many are the plans of a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. In other words, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. I've had a lot of plans over the years that haven't exactly gone as planned. Like in grade school, three years in a row, I wrote Batman under what I want to be when I grow up. (laughs) Unfortunately, I came up a few billion dollars and a perfectly tuned physique short of that particular plan. I used to stand on my bed and sing and practice guitar for hours. Going to be a big star one day. Well, I came a lot closer to that plan than I did Batman, but ultimately my plans for being The American Bono only went so far. I mean, I was in Rolling Stone, I was on MTV, and it was a lot of fun, but no one has ever heard of me. I still didn't find what I was looking for. (laughs) We all make big plans. Plans for the perfect vacation, amazing surprise parties, do-it-yourself home renovations, But then life happens, and it feels like God laughs sometimes. In the first part of our life, we all make these elaborate plans for our education, our career, for marriage and family. And then, later in our life, we wake up one day and wonder where all the time went. I mean, it's good to make plans, but it's even better to have plans that align with God's plans. See, that way he can laugh with us instead of at us. We're continuing to go through the book of Acts line by line. This is the history of the early church. The first big wave of persecution against the church started when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem killed a young man named Stephen. Saul is the one who led that attack on the church, especially the Greek-speaking members, and it caused a lot of the Christians to leave Jerusalem and then spread out all over the place, taking the gospel with them as they went. Well, Jesus put a stop to that first wave by confronting Saul on the road to Damascus and calling him to change teams for the church instead of against it. See, there's two ways to defeat an enemy. And one way is to make them your friend, like Jesus did with Saul. Today, we're going to see an example of the other way. Chapter 12, verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Last week we talked about the church in Antioch taking up an offering because of a prophet who told them a famine was coming. God wanted them to get ready to help the Christians throughout Judea when the food ran out. And it was about that same time that a new wave of persecution broke out in Jerusalem against the church. But this time it wasn't being led by the religious leaders. This time it was the political leader who was put in charge of the Jews by Rome, King Herod. So this is about 10 years after the death of Stephen. The church had been growing in relative peace during that time. And then all of a sudden, Herod comes up with this big plan to be popular with the Jewish leaders by making a show of taking down the apostles, the leaders of the church. So he went after them. He probably saw Jesus and his followers as a threat to his throne 
All these Christians saying, Christ is King, Jesus is Lord. His motivation was not theological at all. It wasn't religious. He just wanted more power. And since it was Passover at this time, he thought he could strengthen the support of the Jewish leaders by giving them something extra to celebrate this time. Most of the apostles were out of town doing ministry in other places with all those other churches that were spread throughout the country because of that first persecution. But Herod found out James was in Jerusalem, so he arrested and beheaded him. James was the first apostle to be killed. There's actually a really great story that was told by Clement of Alexandria and Eusebius, early Christian historians. They said that when James was arrested, he told his guard about Jesus while he was waiting to be executed. And the guard believed, and he was so vocal about his new faith that they executed him too. Now, Luke doesn't say much about James here, but let's give him a proper obituary because he was the son of Zebedee and Salome. He was the brother of John, part of Jesus's inner circle, along with Peter. He was there at the transfiguration, the raising of Jairus's daughter from the dead. He's one of the disciples who was closer to, closer to Jesus when he was praying in Gethsemane. And it was his mom that had asked Jesus if her sons could sit at his right and left hand when Jesus came into his kingdom. Jesus called these brothers the sons of thunder. They were the ones who wanted to call down fire from heaven when a Samaritan village didn't show Jesus proper respect. And yes, he's also the first apostle to be martyred. And it did make the Jewish leaders very happy. So Herod went out, he found Peter, and arrested him too. Verse 3, this was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after Passover to bring him out to the people. See, Herod must think he's very clever because he plans on killing the head apostle, Peter, on the anniversary of the day Jesus had been killed, the day after Passover. And he wasn't going to take any chances of Peter getting away. He's going to guard him with four sets of four soldiers. And then he was going to make a big show of his execution. I mean, a good time for all, right? Bring the kids. Verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. Peter's in jail. He's waiting to be executed in the morning. He's chained to two soldiers at all time. Potty breaks, a little awkward. I mean, this whole scene, it's not going anywhere good, man. Now, he would have been in jail for at least a few days at this point. His friends and the church, they are obviously very upset about this. And they're praying nonstop for him, praying for his life to be spared, for him to be released. I mean, this is Peter. This is the rock, the head apostle. So it's the night before he's going to be killed. And what's Peter doing? Well, he's doing the same thing he was doing on the night before Jesus was crucified. He's sleeping. I mean, I suppose we could see this as a sign of his great faith. Like what? Me? Worry? No. To live is Christ and to die is gain. God is going to do what God is going to do. Or Peter could be like me, because when I get really stressed and overwhelmed, I go to sleep. Not the best survival technique. <laughs> oh, look, a bear. Quick, let's take a nap. <laughs> well, whatever the reason, Peter is sound asleep. 
and apparently so are the guards. Verse 7, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Peter is pretty sure he's having the most wonderful dream. An angel shows up, bright light. It says the angel strikes him in the side. I mean, maybe he tried gently waking him first. Maybe he went straight to punching. Chains fall off his wrists. Peter looks at the guards that he's been chained to. They're still asleep. That's cool. He puts on his cloak, his shoes. Angel says to follow as he leads him out of the prison. And Peter thinks that he's dreaming. Verse 10. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate, lead, iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. I mean, there were multiple guards. I think the angel must have put everyone to sleep, you know? Probably the real reason Peter was asleep too. Because this is not Harry Potter. Peter did not have an invisibility cloak to make it past all those guards. But then they come to the big iron gate that leads to the city, and it just opens like an automatic door at Walmart. Which to the original readers of this story, who knew about the strength and the size of that gate, that would have been an impressive detail. So they walk about a block, and then the angel, he takes off. Peter wakes up from his sleepwalking. He's like, this is really happening. Right on, man. Thanks be to God. Verse 12. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. It's the middle of the night. He needs to get off the street. So he goes to the house of a friend. Mary's place, it's a really nice big house. Probably one of the places that they met for church. Mary's son, John Mark, he's better known to us as the writer of the Gospel of Mark. He was also a disciple of Peter. He's the nephew of Barnabas. So a bunch of Peter's church friends, they were gathered in this house and they were praying for him. Verse 13, and when he knocked on the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it's his angel. Don't miss that this is funny, right? Mary's maid, Rhoda, she's the one who answers the door. She recognizes Peter's voice, and she's so excited that she forgets to let him in. Just leaves him standing there in the street. She runs to let the others know that Peter's alive and well, standing on the porch. And then all the people in that prayer meeting, praying for Peter to be released. None of them believe her. They don't believe God has answered their prayer. They not only don't believe Rhoda and say she's crazy, they try to explain it away with like some really bad theology. It's probably just Peter's angel. Peter's angel? What the heck does that even mean? Like his guardian angel? Did he die and become an angel? Is that how this works? Do angels knock? <laughs> This is classic don't get your hopes up language. That's what this is. 
Verse 16. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. So while they were still mansplaining to Rhoda that God could not have answered their prayers, Peter's trying to knock down the door. And when they finally open it, what do you know? There he is. And they must have kind of erupted into like a joyous hurrah because Peter, he's like, y'all need to calm down or we're all going to get busted. He tells them about his angelic jailbreak. He says to pass the info on to James and the brothers. Clearly not the James who had just been killed. He's talking about James, the brother of Jesus, who had become the leader, the head pastor of the Jerusalem church. And then Peter leaves in the middle of the night. No one knows where he went either. And it's probably best that way. But we will see Peter again. He's going to show up again in a few chapters. Meanwhile, back at the jailhouse, verse 18. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. I'll bet. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Not a good day to be one of those prison guards. Herod's like, you had one job. Herod was not a nice guy. Pretty much the worst. A self-serving, power-hungry, cruel tyrant. He pretended to be a devout Jew, but he wasn't. He was a narcissist who desperately wanted to be popular with the Jewish leaders, obsessed with his own glory and keeping his throne. Herod came from a violent family, too. His grandfather is the one who tried to kill baby Jesus. His uncle is the one who killed John the Baptist and was part of the crucifixion trial. And this guy, Herod Agrippa, he wasn't any different. The Herod family was always happy to sacrifice other people for their own power and influence and popularity. Well, Luke wants to make sure that we all know what happened to the guy who had big plans to kill the apostles. Verse 19, then he, Herod, went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. Doesn't say why Herod was mad with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but he probably didn't need much of a reason. Because that's how it is with people who have unchecked egos. They can be petty. But the people of Tyre and Sidon, see, they couldn't afford for Herod to be mad at them because they were depending on him for food. Seems like that famine they were talking about starting to affect people. So they got an audience with the king through his personal assistant, Blastus. Why aren't there more people named Blastus? <laughs> Perfectly good name, just wasted. Verse 21. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a god! and not of a man. I mean, how vain did he have to be to not know the people were just blowing smoke? Oh, Herod, you are so handsome, so smart. When you speak, it's like I'm listening to James Earl Jones. Herod's like, the voice of a god. Yes, I do have the voice of a god, don't I? I am a God. It's dangerous to believe your own press and make plans for personal glory. Verse 23, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. 
So Herod's moment of glory ends quickly, doesn't it? One minute he's basking in fake praise, and the next, struck down by an angel and eaten by worms. The Jewish historian Josephus, he also records this little incident in his writings. He says, Herod was dressed in a shiny robe that was made of spun silver. And he's given a speech to a cheering crowd in Caesarea when all of a sudden he gets some kind of stomach pain and he's carried away from the throne and dies. And Josephus agrees with the biblical account that he died at the hand of God for accepting blasphemous praise and believing that he was a god in his arrogance and pride. Herod's big plans for self-glory and killing the apostles, see, they directly opposed God's plans. So remember, I said there were two ways to defeat an enemy. Either make them your friend, like Jesus did with Saul, or take them out, like God did with Herod. These are two ways to pray for our enemies. Like Kemper says in his song, Malediction, save them, Lord, or slay them dead. So that put an end to the second wave of persecution against the church. The death of Herod, it was in 44 AD. And the next massive persecution, that's not going to happen until Nero in the mid-60s. So the next 20 years, I mean, not exactly going to be a cakewalk, but the church is going to have enough freedom to continue growing. Verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. And the church still continues to grow. I mean, today, because no political power can stop it. No attacks of the devil can stop it. No internal quarrels. Nothing is going to stop God's plan for the advance and preservation of the gospel going into the world to build his church, which you're part of. And God has plans for you that are not going to fail too. But sometimes he's got to get our plans out of the way first because I'd make a terrible Batman. <laughs> I'm too slow. I'm afraid of heights. I'm not really comfortable in spandex or wearing a cape. But I do get to fight against the evil of the world by preaching the gospel and pointing people towards Jesus, the only superhero that really matters. And I really did think that I would make a great American Bono. But the truth is, I don't really like politics. Plus, I lost most of my hair at 30. It was never going to work out. But I do really love being the pastor of New Church. More than I could have ever imagined when I was standing on my bed playing along with Thin Lizzy records. This is where I'm supposed to be. I couldn't be trolloping around the, gro the globe and also be here with you guys at the same time. So God knew what he was doing. He had to get my plans out of the way. And he knows what he's doing with you too. Not you too. You also. You know how Peter was in jail? The church was praying for him to be released. They're just praying and praying for days. It looked hopeless. And then when God sends an angel and busts him out, they don't even believe it. See, I think that's very encouraging. It's encouraging because the miracle did not depend on the quality of their prayers. It didn't depend on the amazing depth of their faith. I mean, they were praying, but they didn't really believe God was going to do anything. But then he did. And it's the same with us. Because nothing depends on the quality of our prayers either. We don't have to close our eyes really tight and try to faith harder. 
The only thing anything depends on is the quality of our God, the one we put our faith in. Any faith at all is going to be enough faith. Any trust at all is enough trust. So what are your plans? What are your hopes, your dreams? Have they left you frustrated, disappointed? Are they in line with God's plans? How can you even know? Well, you can pray. Doesn't have to be a great prayer. Just tell God your plans. And then listen for his laugh. Listen for redirection. Sometimes just the act of prayer will do the trick. You'll realize what parts of your big plans are in line with his will and which parts are not. Because he'll bring scripture to your mind. He'll help guide you. And you should also talk to like trusted Christian friends, people who know you and also know Jesus. People who can help you wrestle with these things. See if your plans line up with God's word, with who you are, with what you're good at, with what your opportunities are, with his plans. Surrender yourself and trust God. Put your life in his hands. Peter did not break his own chains. He didn't devise a clever strategy for escape. God sent an angel to wake him up and break him out. He was asleep. He barely knew what was going on. Well, Jesus has broken your chains too. You have also been set free. You are not condemned anymore. By his death, your sins are forgiven. By his resurrection, you are justified. You're made right with God. You might barely know what's going on too. But God has big plans for you. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. And here's the best part of that. God's plans don't depend on how perfectly you pray or how carefully you plan. His plans are rooted in his faithfulness, not yours. So whether you feel stuck like Peter or disappointed by life's twists and turns, Remember this, Jesus has already broken your chains and set you free. His plans for you are better than your plans for you. Trust him, follow him, and learn to laugh with him. Because in his hands, your story is guaranteed to go somewhere good. Amen. Let's pray as the band is coming back up here. Father in heaven, we, we confess that we often make plans for our own glory. We rely on our own strength, our own money, our own education. We rely on ourself and our ideas instead of trusting you. Help us to put our trust in you. Forgive us for our pride, for our lack of faith, for the times that we've doubted your plans. We thank you for breaking our chains through Jesus, setting us free from sin and death by his cross and resurrection. Help us to align our lives with your will trusting that your plans are always better than our plans. Strengthen our faith, however small it feels, and remind us that our hope rests in your unshakable faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. For more information, go to newchurch.love or email frank at frankheart.com. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, 
please consider going to newchurch.love slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.